going to be doing some teaching on the Gospel of Mark over the next few weeks. I hope you'll take advantage of the opportunity to learn an entire Gospel um, as we go through this together. Some of you are readers. That's a great thing. Some of you are not. That's okay, too. But for those of you who are readers, I would love to recommend this book, Conversion in the New Testament, Paul and the Twelve by Richard V. Peace. He's a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary in New Testament, and he's written this account of Paul's conversion and also the conversion of the Twelve, but it focuses its biblical study on the Gospel of Mark. And it's what I'm going to be drawing uh, this series from primarily. So I will try to give this commercial every single time I talk. I cannot take credit for the originality of all of the ideas I present to you. Some of them have come before me in the form of this wonderful book. And in fact, the format that I'm using draws on his divisions of the book of Mark because I think they're spot on. I think they're exactly where they need to be. And I think they're helpful. And I think they're instructive to us in our journey as we live our lives with God because what he documents is the journey of the apostles, the journey of the disciples as they move from very little faith or no faith, they're following a rabbi, a teacher, to a stunning conclusion. He was indeed the Son of God. So that is our journey as well. We must come ourselves to that place of stunning conclusion where when we look at the face of Jesus, we say definitively, with faith, with absolute conviction, yes, this was and is the Son of God in whom I believe, and my faith will save me. Um, Mark starts off with a very brief description of John the Baptist who prepares the way. Now you'll notice, unlike Luke or Matthew, there's no account of the birth of Jesus here. There's no shepherds and angels and wise men and all this interesting stuff that those gospels bring out. It isn't like John starting very ethereally. It's very practical. Jesus, says cousin John, is fulfilling the Isaiah prophecy. I will send my messenger ahead of you. And so, verse 4, John the Baptist is in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for sin. And Jesus follows right on that. We read as early as Mark 1.12, Jesus is headed out into the wilderness to be tempted and tested by, by the devil there. Jesus returns from that in verse 14 and says in verse 15, which is the small text in your bulletin today, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, how many of you have written a paper for school before? Almost everybody. A paper has to have an introduction, yes? You generally have a paragraph, at least a well-written paragraph, or maybe it's a precy. It's just three sentences that outline, or a thesis sentence that outlines in two, three sentences, or maybe the teacher makes you do it in one, what is this paper about, okay? If we were to break Mark down, literarily, this right here is the thesis sentence, okay? This sentence is what the entire gospel is about. The time has come, the kingdom of God is near, repent and believe the good news. What Mark wants his reading audience to do is come to the conclusion that the good news is indeed here. The time has come, Christ has arrived. If we will repent and believe on his word, salvation has indeed come. That's what he's hoping for. This is his thesis sentence. Immediately after this, and again, Mark does not waste time. One of the things we can all appreciate about Mark's gospel is that there isn't a lot of flowery language that takes us all over the place. Mark pretty much gets right to it. How many of you people are to the point kind of people? Then I must drive you absolutely crazy. And I know my wife's hand was one of the ones raised. I know I drive her crazy. To the point people like things very plain, very straightforward, very concise. Don't confuse me with words. Just tell it to me straight. Mark is your gospel. Pay attention. Mark is your gospel. God knew that you would think and be the way you are, and this is his word to you. 
straight up. Now is where we say liturgically, thanks be to God. Join me. Thanks be to God. Okay, excellent. 116, right off, Jesus is calling his first disciples. We're going to see this emerge again in the pericope, that is to say the section of Scripture that we're looking at today. And technically, each of these little divisions you see in your English Bible would be a pericope. I'm looking at sort of several chapters as an overarching theme because what we're starting with is the disciples' initial understanding of who Jesus was. You see, when Jesus called his first disciples, they weren't sitting there looking at him going, my Lord and my God. They weren't lying on their faces before him. They weren't worshiping him. He was a rabbi, a teacher. Honorable, to be sure, but nothing extraordinary in their mind except that he paid attention to them. He called them. Now, I'm going to make one more comment on this. I, I like to be chosen. How many of you like to be chosen? I, I think there's something incredibly powerful about being chosen. And what I want you to hear today is that just as Jesus chose 12 disciples 2,000 years ago, you are on his list today. You are chosen. Now, what will be your response and what will be your journey? Right off the bat, our gospel reading comes into focus, and that is that Jesus drives out an evil spirit. Now, I just said something about the disciples in their relationship and understand, in a relationship to an understanding of Jesus. Can anybody tell me, is this microphone on? Yeah. Can anybody tell me what, oh, it, I'm, I have it off. You know, I am sometimes not with it. My apologies to Birker. Let's try it now, Birker. One, two, oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Okay, could you hear me before or do I need to start all over again? <laughs> all right, we're, we're all right there. What did I just say about the disciples and their relationship in under, to Jesus and their understanding of Jesus? What did I just say about it? Rabbi, it was incomplete. He was, I heard something over here. Huh? He had chosen them. That was important too. Anything else I said about that? Yeah, I think you've got it. Was Jesus anything or anybody extraordinary to the disciples at the time of their calling other than that they felt good because he chose them? He was like the captain of their kickball team. Probably not. Yes? No, I think that's right. I think he's just beginning his ministry. He's not famous yet. He hasn't done a lot of works that they've been able to witness or record yet. They don't, they haven't observed him in action. They haven't been taught of him yet. They're just being called, and it's an honor. It's a big deal, but they aren't really, they don't, they don't really know who he is. They certainly are not to the place of recognizing that he's anybody extraordinary. Can we agree on that? At least as far as the Gospel of, of Mark is concerned? Okay. So he's at this place. Now you'll notice the story that I just read, or had read. Thank you, Brett. This extraordinary story of one of Jesus' very first miracles in the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> it says he drives out an evil spirit. Now this is before there are any healings, this is before there's any testimony about him except the testimony that Mark has already acknowledged, that, which is not insignificant, that came from God the Father and the Spirit in the form of a dove at baptism. But Mark doesn't elaborate on that story, does it? He just indicates that John the Baptist came, Jesus was baptized, and went into the wilderness, all in just a couple of verses. All right? To the point kind of guy. Praise be to God. Let's go. To the point kind of guy. Excellent. You're getting it. Okay. They go to Capernaum, which is kind of north, central, west Israel, up by the Sea of Galilee. When Sabbath had come, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. Now, this is, 
I'm going to go very quickly. So if you take notes, take them quickly. If you just file things in your head, file it in your head. First of all, it's possible to deduce several things from this. One, there's something happening around Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee that's important. Two, Sabbath comes and Jesus is where? In the synagogue. He's, te- he, he's in the synagogue and he, he takes up teaching. I'm glad that you're in God's house on the Sabbath day. We could draw that lesson from this text if we, if we wanted to take the time to expound on that. We could find other texts. But Sabbath was the day Jesus chose to go to church. I think it's the day we choose to go to church, and I'm glad that the two are the same. The people were amazed at his teaching. Now, this is the first hint that Jesus is extraordinary. And this word amazed is going to show up again and again because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Now, let me, let me expand this for you in two ways, okay? Just two ways. We'll keep it simple today. There are probably six we could do, but we'll focus on two. They were amazed because he had authority. Having authority is different than referencing authority or seeking authority. Do you understand the distinction I'm making? Amen. Now, let me, let me bring it a little closer to home. It's one of us, for example, standing and teaching, not utilizing the authority of what is, that is to say, Scripture. See, when I teach you, my, almost all of my authority, if not all of my authority, comes from my fidelity to the Word of God. Okay? I rely on an authority as I come to you and teach. Okay? Jesus teaches as one who has authority. So he doesn't teach the Word of God. He is the Word of God. Amen. Now, by the way, we know that by the Spirit we, we will and can do the same thing. Can you think of something coming up in which our scriptures are maybe not complete enough to guide us? It's coming up in uh, Texas this next month or, or week or whatever it is, month. The general conference is going to be meeting. And what we, what we know is that the scripture speaks to certain things, but it speaks to certain things from a frame of reference, a point in time. And there is a question coming up about the ordination of women. And some people think it's very clear in Scripture. And some people think it's not so clear in Scripture. And some people look at it and say it's not even a scriptural issue. We'll find out how the Spirit works and leads our governing body as they try to sort this issue out that moves beyond the limitations of Scripture culturally. A nice little aside, let's come back to Mark, our main point. Jesus speaks as one who has authority, not because he's referencing authority, but because he is authority. That's very important. Not like the scribes and Pharisees. We know that what I'm just saying there is true because they always had to reference authority. What reference of authority did they have? Moses and the law. We're children of Abraham, they would say. Okay? So heritage, tradition, Moses, law, that's the authority of the teachers of the law. But Jesus teaches as one who has authority. The second thing is it's not just a matter of manner. It's a matter of what is being said. He's not bringing something old. He's bringing something new. As he's teaching, a man possessed of an evil spirit is present and cries out. Hear what he says. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. That's a bit freaky, isn't it? You're sitting in church, Jesus is preaching, and somebody goes nuts. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. I don't think you would forget that church service for the rest of your life. 
And depending on how everything went, you may not ever come back to this church again either. Or you may come every week believing a miracle had just occurred. I don't know what it would do to your spiritual experience, but Jesus is called out on the very beginning of his ministry. He hasn't even done in the Gospel of Mark his first miracle yet. And a demoniac stands and says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. The disciples just called haven't put together that Jesus is anybody extraordinary yet. So Mark is setting us up right off the bat with this juxtaposition between the ordinariness of the disciples' view of who Jesus is and the extraordinariness of the vision of the demoniac who by the spirit that possesses him sees Jesus for the spiritual reality that he is. I just have to reference The Matrix again. Okay. Watch the movie, you'll see the parallel. Very exciting. Okay. That's why I watched it like seven times. It was just so exciting. Okay. I know who you are, the Holy One of God, and Jesus says, be quiet. Come out of him. And the impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek, and all were amazed and asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. And he even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. And news spread quickly about him through Galilee. I think we're getting the idea in the, one of the very first stories that Mark will tell that Jesus is extraordinary. He doesn't command the physical world at this point. He commands the spiritual world. Today's first gospel reading will be found in Mark 3, verses 1 through 6, which is also on page 924 in your pew Bibles. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Those people who speak with authority are such troublemakers. And those who command the world of the spirits are even more so. And those who declare any kind of authority against the authority that already exists, well, let us spit, shall we? He had already had strike one. Sabbath had come and a blasphemous claim had come from somebody in the congregation about who he was the Holy One of God. And then, on top of it, he commanded the Spirit to leave on the Sabbath day and it left him. Healing number one on the Sabbath day, a spiritual healing. Healing number two on the Sabbath day, now a man with shriveled hand. We're entering the world of the physical, the world where we live, the world of our day-to-day pains and aches and existence and brokenness and shriveledness. I don't think it's an accident that the first miracle chosen by Mark to express is one of a shriveled hand because what it implies is something really, really, really important. A shriveling is what? A contraction, a diminishing, a movement toward incapacity rather than capacity. It's a pain. Just just cramp up your hand for a little bit and hold it and see how uncomfortable it gets in about 20 seconds. And he shriveled. It's withered. The flesh has begun to decay. That is to say, the muscle mass is gone. It's withered. It's useless. 
And in this world of incapacity and pain, in this world of shriveledness and uselessness, this body comes forward, this person attached to this body comes forward. And Jesus says, stretch out your hand. Now, if Jesus didn't have authority, the logical response to that would be, what are you, crazy? Are you stupid? Can you not see that I have a shriveled hand? Are you mocking me? Is that what you're doing? Do you always make fun of people with disabilities? We might even have more violent responses today. But Jesus didn't say it mockingly. He didn't say it as an invitation. He didn't say it in any way that we're familiar with. He said it with authority, power, <coughs> healing power. And the word went forth, and here's my word. I love this word. It was generative. You see, when Jesus spoke at creation time, what happened? Things that weren't were. And when he spoke to this man, he spoke in a generative way, a way of authority and power, and said, stretch forth your hand. It was a command. And the man didn't have to think. His very cellular fibers began to cooperate as he willed himself to begin to believe that it was possible by the authority of the word that had been spoken him. And his hand unfolded. And withered flesh became healthy flesh and strong flesh and useful flesh. The body was healed now as well as spirit. And there were those looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. Jesus knew this and made this very public. And he used it as an opportunity to test the heart of people. You see, we can do the same thing today. What are we about as a community? Are we about gathering? Are we about supporting one another? Are we about being together in Christ's name? Are we about serving one another? Are we about these things? Or are we about the rules and regulations that might govern that? What is your attitude in relationship to law and people? What is your spirit when it comes to service? Jesus was testing the heart of the people. He not only spoke to them with authority as one like they'd never seen, but he was testing them to see where their hearts were. So he made this very public. And he pushed them. He got up in front of them and he said, which is lawful, to do good or evil, to save life or kill? And they had no answer. Now I know Adventist audiences, we are, I, I've trained you, everybody's been trained to be quiet, respectful, reverent, polite, I mean, you just did fantastic with the thanks be to God thing. That was, wow, for an Adventist audience, you, you might as well be charismatic. It was extraordinary. We're used to quiet. I, maybe the Jews were too, but I don't think so. I think they were used to debating the law. Somebody made a point. Somebody else brought up another point. They spoke. And when Jesus asked the most obvious thing in the world, is it lawful to do good or not, to bring help or harm, they had no answer. Their hearts were hard. Their minds made up. The vision sealed. They were blind and deaf and dumb spiritually. And they had no authority because they had no moral imperative no vision and no spirit. They were the dry bones I spoke of a little while ago. He looked around them in anger. Thank you for translating this correctly. Not righteous indignation, anger. 
We have often thought that emotions somehow, especially negative ones, are not appropriate. Not so. There is a time to be angry, and Jesus exercised it at this moment, rightly so. He's deeply distressed, it says, at their stubborn hearts. Anger and sorrowful at the same time, I'm guessing. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And they decided to kill him. Our third gospel reading this morning comes from chapter 4 in Mark, so I invite you to just turn over the page. The first half of Mark chapter 4 is the parable of the sower. But we're going to be focusing a little later in Mark chapter 4, which one might call the little parable of the sower. I'm reading from Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29. And Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or he gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. He doesn't know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it because the harvest time has come. Christian Schwartz calls these biotic principles, the all-by-itself principle. That is to say that God has imbued in the seed or in nature the plant itself. It has the all-by-itself, so to speak, quality or capability with the proper nutrients, the proper water and sunshine of germinating into something that reproduces itself. Christian Schwartz develops this concept into what we call natural church development. The idea is that if you are being the seed that is watered and sunlight is, is shining upon it, if you've heard the word of the Lord and you're responding to the word of the Lord, it will be natural that you will produce a harvest of grain. Some stocks will produce 20 grains, some 30, some 40, some 60, and some 80 but you hear implicit in this gospel productivity. This is a gospel that tells us not only how the kingdom of God works, this is a story that tells us what we're to be about. And Mark is prophesying as to where the gospel <coughs> that is being teach, taught, excuse, teached, yeah, really good, Greg, taught, excuse me, the gospel being taught, will take those who are hearing, especially the disciples. This is to be a different kind of relationship, not a relationship of obsession and concern with the fine points of law, but a relationship that is connected to the one who speaks and spirits obey, who speaks and flesh is restored, who speaks not as a regular teacher of law, relying on external authority and the commands of men that surround it, but as one who has, who is authority. And this authority says, you're like grain. And when you're planted, and when the sun shines, which it does, and when the water comes, which it does, you will sprout and grow and produce. And if you don't, you'll be cut down and the stalk will be cast into the fire and burned as chaff. What good is a wheat stalk with no grain? Anybody have any ideas? Horse fodder, maybe? to be trampled underfoot, perhaps? Bricks. Bricks, potentially. Not a glamorous thing. Our fourth, or our, our final story this morning tells us what the kingdom of God is like. Now, I just want that to sink in for a minute. Just meditate on that for a moment. 
What is the kingdom of God like? Any of you have a whirly pop? Uh, Ginger turned us on to whirly pop. It's a little aluminum pan with a lid that you can put on it and a handle. And there's a wire that goes down from the handle to the bottom of the thing. And you put a little bit of oil in there and some corn kernels and put the heat on and you sit there cranking your whirly pop. And pop, 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 and don't burn anything this way, right? And it works really fast. And the pop, popcorn starts filling up the pan and you just, your mouth starts watering. The smell fills the room. And there's no burnt kernels to make you go, oh, man, what happened in here? And because you're rotating the kernels, they get hotter and most of them pop as opposed to leaving like a bunch of duds at the bottom. Now, I know you did not come to church for a commercial on Whirly Pop. I do have a point here. If you put a lot of oil and too many popcorn grains in there, what will happen with your Whirly Pop is that the popping will eventually explode the lid right off the pan. Now, imagine that we're here and... I don't know how many people are here today. I'm going to take a wild guess and say 146. And let's say that each of you produce 20 grain. We'll be stacking people like cordwood in here. Okay? We'll be popping right off the roof of this place. Actually, we'll be going to 10 services. Sounds terrific. What a problem to have, right? Elder Rothler, do you think you could find us five more pastors if we were to go to ten services full? Praise be to God. All right. Praise be to God. Christian Schwartz again comes back and says, this is what the church is designed to do. Christians make other Christians. Christians disciple other Christians. This is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a whirly pop popcorn maker that has too many seeds poured in it. It just pops and pours popcorn right out the top. Now, there's another part of the kingdom of God that's not discussed in Scripture. It has to do with butter and salt. <laughs> but I speak as one with authority. <laughs> yes, indeed. Do you hear what's being said? The kingdom of God is not just like this, a seed scattered on the ground, and while the farmer sleeps, the seed sprouts and grows, and he doesn't know how. It's not just this mystery. It's the mystery of the rock that comes, is carved out without hands and comes to the earth and grows into a mountain and ends up filling the whole earth. Anybody recognize that from Daniel's vision? The kingdom of God is that which fills the whole earth with the presence, power, purpose, dominion, and life of God as lived out in you and in me. I said a moment ago that John's thesis statement or sentence was in 1, chapter 1, verse 15. Mark, I said John, didn't I? Oh, thank you. We're so glad for the editors who are going to help me on this along the way. Mark 1.15. Now, if that's the thesis sentence, I would suggest to you, while there are others that expand on this, that this brief pericope, this very short story about the life that is within the seed and the mystery that goes with it when planted, that the farmer who plants the seed sleeps and the water and nutrients and sun and soil do the rest the mystery of the seed sprouting and growing up is god's work in god's church and in you our job is to scatter the seed john is expand mark is expanding this story for us mark is telling us in his gospel that what Jesus is coming for, where he's headed with this, is that we are to be receivers of the word, to grow in the word as a seed sprouted, to be reproductive in that hearing. And also, in this analogy, we're like the farmer. We take seed and scatter it on the ground, and we're not responsible for the outcome. We're there to plant the seed. 
and nature takes care of the rest. Now we know from other stories in scripture, not Mark, but other stories, some falls on hard ground and get plucked up by birds. Some falls in thorny ground and is choked out. Some sprouts in shallow soil and the sun burns it and other falls in soil that's been prepared or is good soil or is ready and produces a harvest. This is not a mystery. For those of you who like it straight up, there it is. So coming back to our main point, in these first chapters, we find that in Mark 2, Jesus forgives and heals a paralyzed man. Mark 2 integrates the healing of body and spirit, for he not only sends his body away whole, but he sends him away forgiven and free from the standpoint of sin. And the one who speaks with authority says, how do we make the differentiation? What is it to you if I forgive him and he's healed, or if I say be healed and he's healed? The two go together. And the Son of Man, as he describes himself, has authority on earth to forgive sins. That's Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, Jesus eats with sinners, having called Levi, a tax collector, to be one of his own. Don't worry about your circles of purity. Find sinners to eat with and tell them the good news or show them the good news. Jesus is questioned about fasting and he has a very witty comeback. He says, look, as long as the bridegroom is present, who's going to fast? As long as I'm with you, we're not fasting. Jesus' presence brings feasting and celebration and fecundity and life. Jesus, end of chapter 2, declares himself Lord of the Sabbath. Here is his authority. Sabbath was made for people, not people for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. This is no ordinary teacher. And the disciples are bearing witness to his extraordinariness. Chapter 3, crowds begin to follow him. He appoints a total of 12 apostles. And he continues to be accused both by his family and teachers of the law. It's in this chapter, very briefly, that he says that harsh thing, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then he says, whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus talks about the parable of the sower, a lamp on a stand, the parable of a growing seed, the parable of a mustard seed, all of this to illustrate the kingdom and the whirly pop explosion through the lid of the popcorn popper. The end, Jesus will calm a storm. But we'll get to that another day. What I want you to leave with today is Jesus is a teacher, yes, an extraordinary one. And as the disciples are bearing witness, having just been chosen, having just been called, they're coming to see that he's not a teacher who teaches with others' authority, but he is authority. He's a teacher who forgives sins, a teacher who heals the body, a teacher who commands evil spirits and heals the mind. He's a teacher who transcends petty understandings of the law and goes to the weighty sort of matters of goodness and kindness and doing well and right and service and justice in the world. We're reading of a Christ who has come to share something of himself and the Father in the form of good news Good news that's like a seed, even a tiny mustard seed, that when planted will grow up into a tree large enough for birds to sit in. The kingdom of God will grow and fill the earth. The kingdom of God is embedded with the all by itself growth principle. 
Oh, yes. Jesus is a teacher, an extraordinary one. In fact, next week, we'll see the disciples transition in their thinking from Jesus as teacher to Jesus as prophet. Join us. We'll see you then. We'll see you at Potluck. And we'll see you tonight for our social at 6 o'clock under the oak tree. God bless you.